Hello, good afternoon. Coming up on the marketplace today, civil society organizations question data given by the finance minister on the Japan Minerals Royalties Agreement. We'll bring you the latest. Tourist sites across the country to get facelift following World Bank funding. And four months paternity leave will tell you how Vodafone Ghana is implementing that to ensure male workers bond with their families. In your shots, the HR director, we will be hearing from her. Thanks for being with us. Details after this break. In our first story this afternoon, civil society organizations are accusing government of massaging data given them during their last meeting with the finance minister on the Japan Minerals Royalties Agreement. As they insist, they will not back down on their demand for a suspension. Addressing a media briefing in Accra, the 22 CSOs said more questions have emerged after they met the finance minister, which convinces them the deal is not in the interest of the country. Ghana cannot expect the market to give a favorable valuation of the IPO, which the minister himself states will be about 0.6 to 3.2 times the asset value. This indicates that Ghana is just gambling on the market for the determination of the value of an important revenue stream to the state. The interesting thing for citizens to appreciate is that through government's communication, it is evident that it is either not paying attention to the revenue flows in the sector or deliberately undervaluing the assets for unknown reasons. When a direct question was posed to the Deputy Minister of Finance on the amount of royalties received from gold in 2019, he said Ghana received about 650 million cities, equivalent of $123 million. The truth is that Ghana received 1.06 billion cities equivalent to $200 million from the big companies under the Chamber of Mines alone. Government has data on the other receipts, yes, yet it decided to underreport the numbers. Well, so the CSO is not backing down. Uh, joining me in studio is my colleague, Joseph Opoku Gakuhu. Uh, monitored that press briefing for us uh, to shed more light on the issues that were raised. So, Joseph, what specific data uh, are the SCSO saying uh, didn't add up? So, uh, Dr. Steve Mantia references data that has come through on how much government and, you know, government ends every year when it mm. comes to gold royalties. So they make the point that looking at uh, the annual return from gold royalties, mm. government has been pegging the figure at $150 million dollars which according to the CSOs from uh, their own checks, when it comes to royalties that are coming from the big mining firms that are registered with the Chamber of Mines alone, they are bringing in more than $200 million. And so right. that is not exactly the figure that government is actually putting out. And the correlation they're drawing is that in coming to a determination on how much a Japan will be worth in terms of the $1 billion that government says it's actually floating the shares and valuing it, you can get that more accurately when you know how much is coming in every year. And not just that, they also complain that when they met the finance minister, um, they additionally did a presentation to them based on the entire Japan agreement and all the details government has. And then they requested for copies of the slides from government. When the slides were sent to them, there were specific portions mm. that were redacted from the slides that came to them. And they are concerned because that would have given them more information to be able to do the necessary interrogation of the arrangement. And, and so they also say they've got some outstanding questions they want clarity on. Five of them, in fact, run us through. Uh, five of them. The first of all, they're asking how government actually valued a Japa at the one billion figure, which mm. is the point that they're making that Ghana earns more from royalty, so then the one billion figure may not exactly be accurate. They're also asking what other investment options were considered by government before settling on the sale of up to 49% stake in a jackal. They think that uh, that is also something that, despite all the engagements, mm. they've not received the adequate responses to. They're also asking why Ghana is patronizing a tax haven internationally 
when countries are encouraging people to stop saving in tax havens. They think the feedback that they've gotten on that thus far is not very much um, exciting. And they're asking why government is exempting a Japa from taxes when it will be partly owned by investors. And they make a big deal as far as that point is concerned because they make the point that the same people who own the 49% stake it's not government, it's private people, and everyone is paying taxes. So how come will they also be benefiting from the non-payment of taxes? And additionally, they're saying that in the 2016 manifesto of the NPP, government assured that they will ensure that mining communities gain more from their mineral royalties. They've mm -hmm. not seen that particularly with this Ejapa deal, and so they want answers on that. Let's see if they'll get those answers. Thanks very much indeed, Joseph Opoku Gapo, with the update on the latest press conference held by the civil society organizations on the a Japan royalties deal. Now, former President John Mahama has announced an ambitious stimulus program aimed at turning around the economy if elected. The leader of the opposition, NDC, announced this at the party's uh, manifesto launch right here in Accra. We will exempt small businesses from paying corporate and personal income tax. Income tax. That is to re-inject their profits back into the businesses. We estimate that this will involve about 1.4 billion Ghana CDs a year. And that will be the best stimulus you can inject back in order to expand small and medium enterprises. For medium-sized Ghanaian businesses, we will reduce the corporate income tax rate from 25% to 15%. In order in order to give them breathing room to be able to reinvest in the, and grow their businesses. But very interesting, we will exempt newly established medium-sized companies that employ up to 20 people or 20 workers from paying corporate income tax for the first year when they are establishing the business. This is important because the most critical time in establishing a business is the first year when you are investing. And when you're investing, it's not the right time for government to come asking you to bring money. And so we will give them that relief. And for businesses that employ 20 or more medium-sized businesses, they will get corporate tax, income, uh, tax exemption for two years so that they can establish the business properly and expand the business to employ more people. We'll exempt commercial vehicles and other commercial equipment imported into the country from commercial, industrial, uh, for commercial, industrial, and agricultural purposes from import duty. We will, we will review the Customs Amendment Act 2020, that's Act 1014, to scrap the law banning the importation of salvage vehicles so you had the, uh, the president talking about reviewing the Customs Amendment Act. Well, automobile dealers in the country have welcomed uh, that announcement by the former president, John Mahama, to scrap the Customs Act, which bars the importation of salvage vehicles. The law, which is expected to take effect next month, has been criticized by the dealers who fear many will lose their jobs. But launching the party's manifesto for the 2020 elections, Mr. Mahama said he would scrap the law if elected. So Joy Business has been speaking with the General Secretary of the Automobile Dealers Union of Ghana, Clifford Anso. We've, uh, we've been interacting with government officials for a number of times. We've been holding meetings with the minister himself in charge of trade and industry, Honorable Alakoju Chimantin, to at least scrap the area that we identified as a threat to our operations. Nothing has been done about that. We went to the president himself, he did promise, but nothing also has come out from that. So yesterday, when we heard the former president made mention of taking away those areas that we've mentioned, in fact, we were excited, we became excited. Since last night, my phone has never rested. A lot of calls are coming in all over. So General, how is everything? Is it going to be positive or negative? Then I told them that, in fact, we've been calling for the total scrapping of the area that we have identified as a threat to our operations. But it appears nothing has been done. Government only keep on giving us promises. Promises upon promises, which 
it's not going to materialize today or tomorrow. So if somebody is saying that when you give me the opportunity, even though it's a manifesto promise, if you give me the opportunity, I'll do whatever that you want, that's a good news for us. Mm. So yeah. is, is, is it something that you trust will happen? Yes. You see, the thing is that we are getting to uh, the election period. And all the political parties are making their promises. And when somebody says something and they say you don't trust or you don't believe it, when free SHS, you know, issue came about before the 2016 election, people were agitating. But when uh, President Agufuadu came in, it has come to stay. So when Pres uh, former President Mahama also says that when I come, I'll do this and that for you people, we believe that when he also comes, he can do it. And we've got a few months more to the elections in December. And in the last few days, there have been complaints about unsolicited electronic communications from political parties. And the Ghana Chamber of Telecommunications has been addressing that in a statement. Let's pull that up for you. It says that Ghana's mobile industry comprising of leading global network operators, namely Airtel, Tigo, MTN and Vodafone, would abide by existing guidelines and best practices on the incidence of spam and unsolicited electronic communications while supporting their customers with education. Now, the Ghana Telecom, the Ghana Chamber of Telecommunications has noted with concern customer complaints across various media relating to a recent political party's unsolicited message. The Chamber would like to state unequivocally that its members, the mobile network operators, are politically neutral in their policies and principles prohibit the promotion of any political party as an industry we are committed to working with all stakeholders to ensure the continued growth of our democracy the statement says by the ghana chamber of telecommunications let's move on to other stories the ghana tourism authority is targeting to improve on tourist sites across the country as the world bank makes available four million dollar funding the tourism sector has been one of the most affected by covid 19 Volta Region Director of the Authority is confident the development of infrastructure will increase government's foreign exchange income. I can say that at least as of the close of 2019, our data that we had collected from the various tourist sites uh, show that we had, it was, it had increased from 85,000 that were guided to about almost 92, 93,000 visitors. And we know it's not all the data that we can capture. So those that visit the tourist sites and the sites that cover that we're able to get the data from. Well, I spoke to a number of tourists, I mean local tourists, uh, when I visited Vli and um, Tafia Tome, and a number of them mentioned the poor nature of infrastructure. Yes. Which being one of the key challenges. Yeah. Tafia Tome, for instance, they mentioned that they need probably a guest house or a hotel for those who come to lodge and stuff like that. I have seen uh, some projects springing up. Then uh, on the Vli side, they mentioned the fact that maintenance of the bridges the nine bridges you have to cross before you get to the destination being one of the critical challenges yes um generally speaking attraction sites in ghana have challenges in terms of um infrastructure and other facilities that will enhance the, the experience of tourists that is a major challenge and as a result of that the ministry of tourism uh, with the help of the ghana tourism authority is putting measures in place to be able to uh, 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 step up these uh, sites and their, their capacities. So I think the first step, which we we'll probably know, is the fact that we have passed the, the Parliament has passed the LI 2393 for tourist sites, which has spelled out specific things that each site must have, the different types of sites, the categorization, and the standards that they must have. Now, having come out with that, the next step is how do we help them to come up? So as you can see, when you went to Tafi, you see, we are helping them now to bring up the standards to the level that we think it should be at. It's only that we visited the other sites. I remember my chief executive officer, Mr. Kwesi Ajiman, came here and we visited most of the tourist sites and assessed their needs. And so we have started. We have started with Tafi. We'll move on to the other sites as well. So we actually went to Evli, discussed with them, saw the needs there, and we are gradually working on But we will not say because the sites have not been uplifted to those levels, they should still should operate. So that's why we are helping them now to put in the minimum protocols that are needed to make the place safe for visitors to come. And then as they start coming, we would, when we finish with one, we we'll move on to the other. Secondly, there is this um, World Bank project uh, scheme that is ongoing. 
and we ask and the scheme is to help upgrade tourist sites okay. and it's a fund a four million dollar fund that has been made available to the industry and uh, the four million dollars is being applied to tourist sites across the country and that was the vault region director of the Ghana Tourism Authority speaking there to my colleague uh, Fred Duo, who in subsequent bulletins will be bringing us uh, more stories on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the tourism industry in that part of the country. Now, to some news that would excite you if you're a mail worker with Vodafone Ghana, the telecoms firm has begun the implementation of a new paternity policy aimed at contributing to bonding between mail workers and their families after childbirth the program inspired by good practices from Vodafone's operations in other countries has taken effect from September this year to give four-month leave days, yes, four months, to mail workers and head of human resource at Vodafone Ghana, Hannah Ashokai Akron, told Joy Business that the, the policy will position the company as employer of choice as well as boost employee and family relations fathers, not just mothers, to have a central um, role in, you know, how the, the kids are born and how they are bonding with the kids and all of that. And so we thought it fit to, to roll that out. So on September 1st, we rolled out the policy and um, we've had very, very good feedback from both internal, of course, employees and from external as well. And then the other uh, part as well, we also extended the four months to employees who have um, children um, who, who become new parents through surrogacy or through adoption as well because you know there's the various ways to have children to bring children into the into your life into your family and so we extended uh, that for for employees who have babies through surrogacy and through adoption as well but apart from the excitement from the male mm -hmm. uh, employees uh, and the females as well because they're hoping for a lot of help well they're, they're hoping that you know the the husbands who work in various organizations you know they, they pick that they didn't, they didn't say, oh, why uh, our meals are Why are they getting four months? Uh, um, initially, we had some female employees who were like, well, you know, if we're, they're going to have four months, then we need to have, you know, six I months. We need to have, yeah. you know, more of that. What we have with our female employees is once they get back after the four months, there's a, there's a gradual process in them coming back. And so they work 30 hours um, for the next six months um, as well. And so they still, you know, have that opportunity. Um, but yes, I think it's, it, it was very important for us that, you know, our male employees um, do have the bonding time with their families. You know, we can't be teaching employee values and family values and then be doing something contrary to that. So, so you, you did mention that you had a lot of consultations and all that. Mm -hmm. Has there been any like, guidelines as to how this bonding should go? So when the father is home, he's not watching <laughs> You know, yes. Those kind of things. Has there been any guidelines? To, so yes. You ensure that these things are achieved. Absolutely. So um, the same thing that we do with our female employees when they're going on maternity leave, we actually have a whole HR program that we sit them down, we talk them through, you know, what to expect, and even during the time we have, you know, uh, we try to have the line managers check in with them, what's going on, uh, do you need any help? Um, and then as they're getting back as well, we do like an onboarding uh, back to work. And then before they leave, we have, uh, you know, the various teams have different uh, baby showers. And then, you know, we have a gift basket, a Vodafone baby, we call it Voda, Voda Baby Program. And so, you know, we have different things that we give to the new baby. So the new baby is already a part of the, of the Vodafone family. So as the men are going, one thing that we've been very clear is that, you know, you need to spend the time with the family, with the baby, trying to bond, and that's the whole, um, that's the whole brain behind what we're doing. And so it's not for you to, you know, just leave the new mother in the lurch and, you know, be roaming, be roaming about. That's that's not what we're expecting. But I think that um, our employees get that, and they they really are looking forward to to having this time with their, mm -hmm. with their with their newborns. That, that brings me to my next question. Uh, now, what happens? Uh, the company is doing this for uh, the male and female employees. Mm -hmm. What does it seek to achieve at the end of the day after they, they, they've gone home, they've come mm -hmm. back, and all that? What impact is this policy bringing onto the company? What mm -hmm. new, I mean, agenda is it bringing to the company? Mm -hmm. 
what was the expectation on that? Well, first of all, apart from the goodwill um, that you build with employees with a policy like that, I mean, already I have, you know, a, a number of people who've called me um, touting what we've done, um, you know, touting Vodafone as indeed a top employer, an employer of choice that we, um, you know, try to position ourselves as. Now, employees who go out see that we have actually, you know, it, we, we put a lot of effort in to make sure that this took off. And so as they're coming in, they're more productive. Um, the time that they've spent with their families as well, of course, is very good for them. It's very good for the society at large, right? So that we're having, you know, a, a males having such a, a, um, a good, you know, bonding experience with their children right from the, right from the onset. They're not just two weeks and then, you know, lay everything on the, on the, on the mothers and then come back to the office. So when they come back in, um, we expect them to be very productive. We expect them to really tout what we're doing here at Vodafone. Very interesting conversation there, my colleague with the HR director of Vodafone Ghana. And uh, if you ask me, I think it's very exciting uh, for male workers over there at the company. Let's talk innovation. The College of Technology of the University of Education has developed an automatic energy efficient system that conserves about 70% of electricity. The system is able to turn off lights and other electrical appliances connected to an installed facility when the room is vacant after 10 minutes. Principal of the college, uh, Professor Frederick Safo, says the automatic energy system will help reduce actual electricity consumption. Professor Pierre has more in this report. After about 10 to 15 minutes, it comes, it comes, it goes off. That's the essence of it, to, for it to go off and save and conserve energy. But that's what we realize now. This system is designed to switch off power automatically 10 minutes after the last person leaves the room where the device is installed. It was engineered by Isaac Prempe, a final year student of the university, with support from Francois Sechere, a lecturer of the Electronic and Electrical Engineering Department of the school. After piloting the system in four lecture rooms on campus, authorities say it saved 70% of electricity cost. Dr. Albert Awoponi is head of the Electronic and Electrical Technology Department of the College of Technology. Of the Initially, we measured it at the first three months. It conserved about 70% of power it was conserved. 70%, yes. And we did the, the economic analysis and realized that um, the amount of uh, the, uh, the, the cost of energy saved um, could pay for the device after three months. So we actually fixed at four months as the break even uh, point. So with this device on, you now have lights being on only when students are here. That is from around 6 o'clock p.m. to about 11. That is the only period that you use power. So if you can calculate it, see that sometimes even the 70% we're talking about is even consecutive. The school intends to replicate it across the university and commercialize it. In fact, it can be used to, it's just about connecting anything that you want to connect to it. But currently, it's the farms and the lights. So the farms and lights will both go off. After, after the previous, at the time we set it now for 15 minutes, you can actually tune the time to any time that you want. We realized that 15 minutes was sufficient because if you set it to a lower time, what will happen is that if people come to the class and there's no movement, if the light will be flipping, that within 15 minutes is enough time to get another person to move. Because it actually sends people in the room. The sensor is a movement sensor. So if you don't move at all, it will not, it will not sense you. Almost uh, a year now, Yes, so we think it's enough time and we've tested it and it's fine. We can now replicate it in the other classrooms. Meanwhile, the Faculty of Technology has also developed a hand washing machine that is powered by both solar and electricity. It was engineered by two students, Prince Asabre and Udro Boating, and is meant to support the fight against COVID 19. Professor Frederick K. Safo is principal of the College of Technology of Education. It's a solar from electrically powered automated hand washing machine that you have seen in front of this room. We greatly improved the popular Veronica bucket against challenges of having to open and close taps during use and the use of paper towels for wiping up wet hands. Management has supported Department of Electronic and Electrical Technology Education to manufacture 12 pieces of the machines 
and Comotech is going to share with other campuses of UW. This forms part of our effort towards supporting and achieving measures that Ghana government and UW management have put in place. Meanwhile, the university plans of commercializing all these technologies onto the market. Prince Apia, reporting. And as we wrap up this afternoon, we want to bring you a quick take with the Executive Director of the National Board for Small Scale Industries, uh, Kosian Kiaye, talking about how small scale businesses in every district uh, in the country, how they have benefited from government stimulus package. There are, there are two types of loans. There's the Adom and the Indaswa. The Adom was looking at the micro segment, those who applied up to 2,000. And then from 2,000 upwards was the Indaswa segment. Disbursement has started for both of them. And we have over 150,000 applicants who have benefited from the micro, small, and medium enterprises loans through the CAPBAS program as we speak today. In all sectors, in all regions in Ghana, and in every district in Ghana, a beneficiary, there's a beneficiary in one of those districts and regions. And that's the marketplace. My name is Daryl Kwao.